morning, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming out on this really cold evening. We appreciate it, and we're happy to have you here. Please enjoy the refreshments, courtesy of the Friends Organization. I also would like to say that we have a special group, a guest tonight, a, a book group coming from out of town just to come here to see Jane Healy. So let's welcome our book <laughs> I'm very, very happy to introduce Jane Healy. She is a, I'd say, local author, Melrose Arlington, uh, writes historical fiction, and she didn't want to brag, but this book was just listed as number seven on the Washington Post bestseller list. So congratulations to Jane Healy. So she's going to speak, and then after, I think you'd be willing to sign books and meet everyone, and so take questions. and take questions after. So, um, please welcome Jane Healy. Thank you. Thank you for a lovely intro. Um, so, thank you for coming out. I have um, two mantras I live by as an author, and one of them is, it is um, a miracle every time someone decides to read your book. So, thank you for that. And I, I think the second miracle is anytime anyone shows up at one of your events. Uh, especially when it's 19 degrees out. This is incredible. Thank you so, so much. Um, I, I don't want to get feedback here. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the history behind the story of the Beantown Girl Girls, but I'll start with a little intro about myself. I was a product manager in high tech, actually, 15 years ago, and then my daughters were born. They're 12 and 15 now, and I started freelance writing. And I'd always wanted to write fiction, so I dabbled with that on the side, and that resulted in the Saturday Evening Girls Club finally being published. I'm gonna, is that? Sorry, I'll go over this side. The Saturday Evening Girls um, finally being published um, almost exactly two years ago. And then, um, and then, of course, the Beantown Girls was just published almost exactly a month ago. Um, so today, I wanna talk about how I first learned about the Red Cross Club Mobile Girls of World War II and the history behind the story and then how I built a fictional narrative based on the history. So um, Saturday Evening Girls came out. I wanted to kind of strike while the iron was hot with my publisher and come up with a new idea. And so I started kind of researching everywhere and anywhere and chasing my next story. I am a huge fan of World War II history and World War II historical fiction. My grandfather was a firefighter on the Navy ships in World War II off the coast of Europe and Africa. Um, so I've always been interested in that, but I definitely wanted to write another female-centric story. Saturday Evening Girls Club was about a group of women friends. I wanted to write a story about women again. And so I was you know, looking around, Googling, doing the whole thing. And I actually, this was the picture I saw um, on Pinterest. Pinterest has an amazing amount of World War II pictures and old photos and, and things. I actually have a couple Pinterest boards of them if you ever, ever want to check them out. So this um, picture of these four women, I didn't recognize the uniforms. and the caption underneath was something like, you know, somewhere in England, 1944, Red Cross Club Mobile Girls. And immediately I was like, what's a club mobile, first of all? And also, what's a club mobile girl? So that was, um, that was the, this picture was what kind of piqued my interest, and I had to pull that research thread. But before I talk about the club mobile girls, I want to talk a little bit about the Red Cross in World War II, because I didn't really have context for how much they worked hand in hand with the military back then. Um, there was seven and a half million volunteers at the war's peak. They worked hand in hand with the military, like I said. 40,000 paid staff provided services at home and abroad to 16 million military personnel. 3,000 US women volunteered for overseas work. That was often paid jobs. You know, they volunteered, but they were paid. Um, by the war's end, this, I, this stat was fascinating to me. Every household in the US had a member who had either served in the Red Cross, made contributions of blood or money, or was a recipient of Red Cross services, every single household in the US. So the Club Mobile Girl program, Red Cross, um, morale was one of the military's biggest challenges, uh, particularly towards the you know, latter half of the war. And there were Red Cross clubs in major cities. One of them is in London, and it's featured in the book. Um, and so the military went to Harvey Gibson specifically, who was the head of Europe, the Red Cross Commissioner for Europe, and said, you know, these clubs in the major cities are, are amazing and you know, very helpful, but what can you do for our guys in the field? They, you know, their morale is low. We need, we need more support for the men in the field. So Harvey Gibson came up with the idea of 
bringing the services to the soldier and basically creating clubs on Red Cross clubs on wheels, staffed by three women. And they were essentially, in terms of the look of them, they were equivalent of the modern day food trucks that you see to serve coffee and donuts and, you know, Sephora. So of course, free cigarettes and candy and, um, and, and go to at or near the front lines of the war. Whoops. Okay, sorry. So the first, very first club mobile girl is a woman named Hope Simpson, and she helped found the program with Harvey Gibson. Uh, the first club mobile was the St. Louis in the, in the UK. The program started in the UK first. Um, and in the UK, they, they had Greenland buses, actually, that they converted into these food trucks. And they were so huge, they actually had like lounges in the back where people could like dance and hang out and smoke cigarettes. Um, but um, those weren't practical for the continent uh, of Europe. So first service date was 1942, but then when they, when they decided to bring the program over to the European continent, um, they had to convert GMC trucks, two and a half ton GMC trucks, because they were more practical for the war zone. And, um, and the women actually had to learn to drive them, which was definitely a challenge, because a lot of women didn't even have their licenses back then. So, so this is a good look, you know, you can see there, this was a flap that opened and they'd serve the coffee and donuts and, and blare music when it was safe enough to do so. So becoming a club mobile girl, this was interesting to me too. It was a really sophisticated recruitment campaign. They didn't just choose anyone. They went all over the country um, interviewing girls. They only chose one in six out of the women that applied. And um, they went through a really rigorous selection process. They had to have reference letters and physical exams and go through many rounds of interviews to see if they had the personality type for the program. These um, are some of the descriptions of what they were looking for in, Red, uh, in the Red Cross Girl. They had to be cream of the crop, and uh, once again, this was the 40s, so they were handpicked for their looks and personality um, experience in recreational fields. They had to be really fit because they were often like lugging tons of lard and big sacks of flowers. So they, they had to be in good shape. Um, All-American girl next door type of course. And an interesting point, they had to be over 25 and college educated, which, so that really, you know, that really narrows it down in the 40s to begin with, and yet they still only chose one in six women. But um, I think one of the reasons they chose, they had to be over 25 is because a lot of the soldiers that they served were 18 and 19 years old. So I think the age difference was helpful in terms of, you know, warding off flirtations and romance, so. So the training, they were all sent to American University. They had a six-week training program, but then later in the, on in the war, they were so desperate for clubmobile girls, they had to con condense it into two weeks. Um, they were trained in military procedures and security. Um, they also, again, more rounds of interviews to see how they could engage in small talk. Um, recreation course is really funny. They had to all know the latest dances, <laughs> games. Um, they had to know badminton and volleyball and how to play because, you know. Um, so the training in London got more serious and um, a lot of them talked about that was kind of a, getting to London was kind of a shock to them because all of a sudden, you know, there was air raid sirens going off and bombs dropping everywhere at all, day, all times of the day and night. Um, they had to learn first aid for the field, driving lessons, and they had to get a British license before, um, before they graduated from this training program. Donuts and coffee making instructions, which um, you would think would not be that hard, but when you're in a little tiny truck, like in the middle of the forest, and they're, like it, it, was, it was awful. These, these machines were donated by like the American Donut, Donut Association, and they broke all the time. They like, and you know, then they'd freeze up because they were often in like freezing cold weather. So that was kind of a disaster to the point that towards the end of the war, they, they started outsourcing the actual making of the donuts. They, and they'd make maybe a dozen or so to, just for, because the guys liked, liked them making donuts. But, but they got all the other donuts from like bake, nearby bakeries. So where did the girls go? They went everywhere, um, every war zone, everywhere there was, everywhere the war was, um, you know, France, Belgium, Germany, even India and Burma. By the numbers, so at, war's, at the war's peak, there were 289 clubmobile girls all over the 
the world and over a thousand Club Mobile Girl volunteers. And one person asked me in my last presentation, were, were they volunteers only? But they were actually paid. And I, I should look up the, the salary I have it at home, but, um, but they were paid and they'd often just keep a little bit of money and then they'd send the rest home to their family. Because when you're on the road like that, there isn't a lot you can spend it on. So um, in July 1944, after Normandy, 10 groups of 32 girls were sent to the continent and eight club mobiles per group. This is uh, interesting. 50, so total in World War II, there were 52 Red Cross women killed. Um, and there was about 13, although that's, that number's a moving target for me. I haven't found an exact, but about 13 club mobile girls killed and, in the war. And a lot of that was, um, one of them was injured in the hospital and then the hospital was bombed. And so she was killed. And another one was um, in a, one of the small plane accidents. That was Liz Richardson. Oh, and then final stat, over 1.5 billion donuts served in the war. <laughs> it's a lot of donuts. So then writing the book, I followed the research. Um, we're really lucky to live in this area. I Schlesinger Library at Harvard has um, amazing um, research for you know Americans, American women's history, and I'd worked with them on the Saturday Evening Girls Club. And so when I was working on this, I called them up and I was like, do you have anything on these women? And they're like, we have 13 boxes of letters and diaries and ration cards. And like, they had a whole full uniform that I got to try on and like amazing, amazing stuff. So that was, and the thing that I found was the Clubmobile girls, they had most, uh, most of the stuff was from the Club Mobile Girls in Europe. And they, these women were beautiful writers. When I tell you, like, the lost art of letter writing. They, they, their letters and their experiences, um, that, they, those women in Europe really gave me my timeline. Um, so I wanted to focus on post-D-Day, the latter half of the war, and start in England and move on to France and Belgium. Um, and, it's, and all of the stories in the book are based on some truths. and. In fact, in the back, I, I won't give any way, spoilers away, but in the back I have um, a couple pages of research notes that sort of explain what's fact versus fiction. So um, I came up with my protagonist, Fiona Denning. Um, she was, she's from Boston. She, and all of my, my three main characters are all really composites of the different women I had write about in my research. Um, her fiance is declared missing in Germany. She's working at the mayor's office in Boston, and she's kind of lost and doesn't know what she's going to do now. Um, and so she, they went, she, her friends drag her to a movie, and they see this ad for Clubmobile Girls. And immediately she's like, well, oh, you know, I, I've got nothing else going on. My fiance is missing. Maybe I can find out what happened to him. I'm going to apply. She re recruits her friend Viv, who is working at a dead-end job at an advertising agency, even though she's very talented, but she's a woman in the 40s. So, um, so she's on board immediately, and then they have to convince their friend Dottie, who is really shy but musically gifted, and it, that definitely like helped put you over the top if you had some sort of musical talents to, um, to get chosen as a club mobile girl. So writing the Mean Town Girls, um, this is I had another map, map I lost it somewhere on Google. This one I, I made up quick just to give it sense. Um, so it, the the book takes place between 1944 and 1945, including the Battle of the Bulge, which I didn't know a lot about. Um, it was really fascinating to learn about that. I didn't know a lot about that before, before this research. And the Beantown Girls trip is really the composite of several of the Clubmobile Girls groups' journeys. But it, again, it's all really based in fact. So um, they start off um, in London, and they go up to the Midlands. In, in the UK, and then they head over to Normandy and through, throughout Paris, um, throughout and around Paris in the countryside, and then they end up um, in Belgium um, during the Battle of the Bulge. And then I, I also added, um, you know, at the end of the war, this was a really interesting fact, um, the Red Cross and the military um, t rented a bunch of hotel rooms, a bunch of hotels in the south of France, in Cannes and in Antibes and Nice, and it was like a huge bash with Red Cross girls and officers and, and, and military for like weeks. And so I, I thought that was really interesting. The pictures are um, hilarious. They're so great. So, um, so that's included in the book. The 82nd Airborne and the 28th Infantry Divisions were 
two of the, two divisions that became really close with the, the women that I read about in my research. So they figure prominently in the book as well. And it was really important to me to get the timeline of their experiences in the war. Um, so, so they're also included. So why, why this story? Why did I have to tell this story? Um, based on their letters, it was clear that these women were witnessing history. And um, they had fascinating stories to tell. And I won't give away any of them here. But there were some really incredible stories. And um, one thing that I really want to emphasize is they had more freedom than, mo than war correspondents to get to the front lines. They had access to the front lines more than war correspondents and more than most soldiers, actually. Um, you know, and they were they did a, like some sort of honorary ceremony a few days, few, few years ago, um, in Congress. And Senator Barbara Mikulski said, "The greatest generation serving our country on the front lines in World War II was not limited to one gender." And that was one of the reasons I really felt passionate about telling their story. So they, yes, they were witnessing history, and yet for the most part, I feel like history has left their stories behind. I, one thing that's been amazing hearing from people since this book came out is I never knew about these women. I never heard of the club mobiles. And, and that's what kind of fired me up. I was kind of angry you know, when, I, when I realized like, they, they've kind of been neglected by history. So, um, and some of them were heroes in their own right. And they did receive you know, bronze stars and other honors but from the military for their service because they were incredibly brave. Oh, one spoiler. So, <laughs> I, um, I, I have to give this away. So one, um, one aspect of the war experience for these men and women um, was that they'd, the Red Cross women and a lot of the military, they'd, ad they'd adopt the stray dogs and cats that were abandoned you know, from, by families. And it was another way of that, like another comfort thing, another way of coping with the war. And um, so in the book, there's Burial and the Cat. And it's very clear, she's based on, um, she's named after the singer, Vera Lynn. And um, it's very clear that Vera Lynn makes it out of the war alive. She's fine. Um, I guess it wasn't explicit enough that Barbara the dog um, made it out of the war because I get a, I've gotten a lot of emails from dog lovers wondering, like, <laughs> what happened to Barbara? Is Barbara OK? And so Barbara's OK. Like, <laughs> she makes it back to her soldier, I guess. Uh, I thought that was like, I, I thought I gave the, uh, enough detail on that, but people are very concerned about Barbara. So ba Barbara's good. Um, so two takeaways. Um, one is, you know, I just, I really hope to honor these women by telling the story and honor their history. And the other one is, you know, is people often ask me, like, what's, what are the, what's, what's one of the major themes of the book? And really, it's it, if you change your mind, you can change your life. And a lot of these women, we're on a certain trajectory in the 40s. I don't know why I'm getting feedback. I'm sorry. Um, and and they, cha they changed their life by um, making this decision and taking this risk and, and being brave. Um, is that, am I over here? <laughs> is that better? Yeah. Yeah, because it's like I'm trapped in the middle. OK. <laughs> well, that's my last slide, though, so I can like walk out here and take questions. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, so if anyone has any questions. Yes. I had oh, uncles who were in the war, and I never heard any of them. And they told funny stories all the time. But I never heard any of them mention these women. Not I would think they would be the communicators. They would come back and talk about the clubmobiles and the fun they had, or the at least the dogs. <laughs> right, right. So she, the question is, you know, I, I, she, that you have relatives that, and they never mention these women. And yeah, and often, I, you know, I've heard that. And um, I, my grandfather, I, and I think a lot of that generation was like this. He came back, and he had, our, our, and he was, he was done. He did not want to talk about it. Um, you know, my, um, my mom has a friend, Helen. She's 94. Her husband was in the Battle of the Bulge and didn't talk about it either. But her. Her daughter just found a picture of him standing in front of a clubmobile, like holding a donut. Oh, wow. Like he never talked about it, but I mean, they were there. But yeah, a lot of them, I think, just wanted to put the past in the past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did the term uh, from the founder Gibson? Did the Gibson girls kind of relate to this? Were the Gibson girls, like you said, they were really selected? Oh the Gibson yeah. Gibson girls were in the movies.
Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, no, different, totally different group. Yeah, no, not related. Harvey Gibson was, um, yeah, he was a Red Cross guy, but he's actually, I was a New Hampshire guy. He opened, he started Mount Cramnor. Right. He's, he, yeah, believe it or not, he's a local guy. But yeah, no, no relation to the Gibson girls. Okay, yeah. we had a lady from North Reading that volunteered, um, and she went to work in Washington, and she is, she was considered a wave. Oh, yeah. Not the waves that we have today. It was the women's auxiliary volunteer or something. Right, right. Another great right. group of and group so, of women. Yeah. She had she participated in the honor flight that they give to veterans oh, amazing. in Washington for the day. <clears throat> and she sat at a table and with other people from World War Two and she said to the man sitting next to her who was of Asian descent. She said, what part of the service were you in? And he said, I was the glider pilot. Oh, she said, what did that do? What, what does that entail? And he said, uh, you know, Tom Brokaw, he said, well, I'm chapter three in his book. Oh, nice. That's a nice claim to fame, being chapter three in, in the Greatest Generations book. That's pretty defining. <laughs> when she came home, she got Brokaw's book and she read it. Oh, nice. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Any other questions? Oh, back, okay. yeah, back there. I'm curious about the letters that you read from the library um, about how revealing their content was because I have letters from family members that were involved in the war that were in the military and they were very uh, controlled what mm -hmm. what type of things they could talk about and um, I had an uncle that was in uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and his letter basically reads thanks mom for the handkerchiefs and right, right. you know we had a bit of a kerfuffle you know the other day and, and, and how he was woken up in his pajamas but everything's fine and please thank Uncle Frank for the cigarettes you know yeah. and I mean there's there's there was very little that was shared and I was wondering uh, how you found what the, what the content was from these women were they able to actually talk about more details of what they were seeing. Okay, so that's an excellent question. The question is, um, you know, the women's letters and what they could actually share from home. And so th they could not share that much. They were censored. So they, uh, they couldn't share many details at all. And also, they wanted to protect their family. They didn't want the family to know how close they were to danger. So the, the thing that was really helpful, though, and, and I often saw this, like, they'd send a letter home, and then you'd read their diary and get the real story of how, how dangerous things were, how, how crazy things were, but um, it was very sanitized for the home audience. Um, you know, really just so their parents weren't worried, and also, I mean, it, everything was censored, so. But thank you, that's a good question. Um, you had one, yeah? Yeah, what was your inspiration for the Saturday Evening Girls Club? Oh, the inspiration for the Saturday Evening Girls Club, thank you for asking. Um, I had written an article, I, I, was, I did a lot of shelter magazine work, home and garden, Boston home, New England home, and um, I had written an article about the pottery. Um, and I was kind of intrigued by the pottery, and once again, intrigued by this group of women. I grew up in Arlington, I've lived here all my life, I'd never heard of the Saturday Evening Girls Club. And, um, and so that was kind of what led me down that path. Thank you. Was there another question back here? No? Okay. Oh, go ahead. Through your research, were you able to touch bases with any of these women that I'm sure there's not a lot that are still living, but were you ever able to touch bases with any of these women? Uh, well, well, have I been able to touch base with any of the women? So that's a great question, too. So most of them would be in their mid to late 90s or older. Um, I, have, I have not been in touch with them, but um, there's actually a couple of groups of People are really interested in club mobile history that like keep me in, like abreast of things going on and send me pictures. And there was an article in a in Midwestern paper um, celebrating the hundredth birthday of of one of the, Jill Knappenberger, one of the club mobile girls. So I actually emailed the newspaper to try to get in touch. I haven't heard anything yet, but it would be fascinating. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And there's um, some oral histories on YouTube if you Google, you know, Red Cross club mobile girls World War II. There's some. Um, amazing oral histories on there that were also really helpful. Oh, yes? How long would they go out for? How long would they? Like, would they like a six-month tour or? It seemed like, oh, 
times where they were on leave, but they, they didn't go home during that time. Um, and some of them, it, you, some of them were like, you know, I'll do my time and I'm done, but some of them it really became a calling. They really loved the work. It was like, a, you know, something so different than anything they, they'd ever experienced and, and stayed on even longer than that. And were promoted and moved up the ranks in terms of the Red Cross, so. Oh. Okay. Yes. Are you working on a new book, and can you share it? <laughs> Am I working on a new book? Thank you for asking. I, um, you know, my agent asks me about it every day, but um, <laughs> I am doing research on a new um, project. Um, all, you know, I wasn't really planning on doing World War II again, but I, I and I, I'm superstitious, so I can't say too much. But it's um, another group of women uh, during wartime. So, um, so I'm more. Yeah, it's. When do you expect it out? <laughs> uh, again, my agent would hope for 2020, but I, I'm, I'm thinking 2021. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This one um, was really, really tight time, timeline. It, my deadline was April 1st of last year for my first draft. Um, so, of my first draft to my editors, I, and I had to write it in six months. Um, so that was pretty brutal. I, like, <laughs> so I was like a little burnt out after that. And, and then there's editorial rounds after that, of course. So, um, so yeah, I'm, just, I'm really excited to dig back into the research. So I really enjoy that part of it. Thank you. And I'm sorry, you were... Well, my question was sort of about serendipity and, and the fact that Harvard happened to be the repository of these boxes of d diaries. How did that happen to come about? And what would, what would have happened if you called them up and said, do you have anything? And they said, no. What would you have done? With oh, <laughs> so the question is, if Harvard didn't have anything, what would I have done? I, I will say too that there's about a half dozen books that I have that I bought used online um, that were either written by family members of Clubmobile girls. One of them is more of an academic book about Liz Richardson, one of the women that I mentioned. Um, that and and so and so that, yeah, there, I had a half dozen books to go on that was like memoirs and letters and diary type things. Um, I had some online resources, although you have to be careful with that. Um, but I probably, I, I think there's um, more even in DC and archive material about the Red Cross women, so I probably would have had to search a little farther. I just got, I got very lucky. Uh, I mean, and uh, you know, Schlesinger Library at Harvard is like, it's one of the American women's history museums around, so I, we're just lucky to live here too, I think. And how did they happen to come there? I mean, did. Did, did they solicit the donations, or had someone gathered the diaries? I mean, it just seems an odd... No, you know, I, they do a lot of um, archival work, so I'm okay. sure that probably the, the Red Cross or the, the families um, that started the whole process, And because some, some of the letters were the handwritten letters of the women, and some of them were, like, basically little books typed up by the family members to sort of preserve the material. It was a question back there, yeah. <coughs> Did they continue on, the Clubmobile girls, did they continue on in Korea or Vietnam? Yes, in Vietnam and Korea, there were Clubmobile girls, and there's, yeah, there was, there's videos, uh, oral histories of those women on, on um, YouTube as well. So the program did continue. Um, I, I don't think there's anything like it today, but, but up to Vietnam there was. So this, so this was integrated as part of the Red Cross itself? Yes, it was it's integrated as part of the Red Cross itself. Um, but they, you know, this is... Um, no medical training. Yes, and, and actually that's, a, that's another point. Um, they were in, in danger zones all the time, but they didn't have the Red Cross on the top of their trucks, which is one thing they compl complained about because they weren't medics. So they didn't deem them worthy, I guess. <laughs> so even though they, had, they weren't armed, you know, some of, them, some of the soldiers taught them how to you know, shoot guns, but they were never armed and, yeah, and going into these danger zones, but no, no protection with that Red Cross on the truck which I thought was kind of amazing. In, in um, next to Germany, there's the country of Luxembourg, and there's a city named Luxembourg within the country, and there is a memorial cemetery. It's a mini Arlington where the people from the, the uh, soldiers that were in the Battle of the Bulge are buried. Yes. And, um, General Patton was at the head of that, yes. and he 
came back, he survived the Battle of Fudge, but when he came home, he, talking with his family, he said that when he died, he wanted to be buried with his men. Patton, General Patton wanted to be buried with his men, yeah. They, they did bring him there, and they had a 24-7 um, guard, a military guard, there, and it's really a nice, nice cemetery. Oh, I'll bet, yeah. General Patton was mentioned in some of the letters and diaries, um, and I really kind of wanted to try to weave him into the book, but it just didn't didn't work. But yeah, he was yeah pretty extraordinary guy. Any other questions? Yes. So I already told you earlier that I love your writing. I love the book. It's Thank my you. My favorite book of yours, and I've actually I've been telling people and anybody that wants to listen to read this book. Thank <laughs> you. And you got me on a, an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> I was in fear. I was in love. <laughs> I cheered. I was like, I even did some research up, and I like. I listen to the book. I do audio books. Oh yeah. Oh, she's excellent. The she audio book. Oh, she was wonderful. Sarah. Yeah. And um, but some of your acknowledgement in the back of the book, and um, was really like, wow. Okay, that really did happen. Like, wow. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I fell in love with these three characters. Thank you. I fell in love with their soldiers that they came across and their other clubmobile girls. And um, very well done, Jane. Very Thank well you. Done. So sweet of you to say. Thank you I very much. I liked your first book, and but this one here, hands down, my favorite. That's what my husband says too. <laughs> He's like, no one's going to tell you that but me. <laughs> Thank you. I just finished the book over the weekend too. And I Oh, thank you very much. Well, I, it's funny when my I was sent it to my editor, my two editors, and you know they'd make notes in the margins, and they're like, and I'm crying again. Like, they're like, maybe it should be sponsored by Kleenex. And, oh, but when I say that too, I want to um, also add, like, I, you know, it, it's war, so you can't sugarcoat war. But um, but I really wanted to kind of, um, I I hope that it has like a heartwarming and hopeful feel in the end. You know, I really wanted to be. A, a, and then I'll be, you know. Well, many books that I think could be into a movie, but this is one I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep you posted. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Do you think that um, as you continue to write, you feel that you need to always give women a voice, or, you know, is your goal to give, you know, the, the kind of like the side stories? The reason I'm asking is, um, when you were talking about, um, you know, about when this lady was talking about Luxembourg, my husband and I were in um, Italy last fall. We went to Anzio, and oh. you mentioned Anzio. A lot of people say, "What is it and where is it?" Unless they're from another generation who actually read history or lived through um, Anzio, and there are thousands of soldiers buried there. It, yes. it looks like Arlington, but with the Italian twist. Mm -hmm. um, and the Italians are <coughs> nominally respectful of the cemetery. It's, I believe, maintained by the U.S., um, but they also have a, um, a really interesting um, museum that they put together on their own, the Italians, and they're they're so proud of that museum. It wasn't open on the day we were going, but we contacted them, and they brought in their staff. Oh, amazing! To open, um, to open it for the Americans, and um, so I guess what I'm saying is, you know, how do you choose which voice, you know, you're going to say, and it would, do you think it will be women? Do you think it will be? When we were going through that cemetery, there were so many British. You know, so right. many Americans, so many French, people from there, the stones were, it was flabbergasted, you know, how many people there were, and they were from everywhere, and they're actually buried in their country section. Mm -hmm. but Amazing. The thing that bothered me was, you know, when do they get a voice? Right, right. Um, yeah, there's still... It's amazing, even despite the fact that I feel like the World War II fiction market is pretty crowded right now, like there's still so many stories out there. Um, that So to answer your question, um, you know, I, I, I have to go, like, and then I tell, you know, 
when young writers ask me questions, like you have to find something you're passionate about to write about it because you are going to live with this and you're going to hate it some days. And you, like you have to really believe in it and be passionate about it. Um, and, and so that's kind of, I just go with what, and, and generally speaking for me, that's women's perspective, I think, although I wouldn't rule out a man's perspective. Um, you brought up Italy too. I don't know if you've heard of the book under Beneath the Scarlet Sky by Mark Sullivan. Um, we share the same publisher. That's um, based on the true stories of Pino Lella, who helped smuggle um, Jewish refugees over the Alps during World War II. And that's a, that's a fascinating story and tells a lot about Italy during the war that I didn't know about. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, you're all amazing for coming out in 19 degree weather. Thank you so, so much. This is great. Thank you. Thank you.